The black community suffers from the worst health disparities. The Minister of Wellness Ministries is the only pro-black Bible-based health ministry of its kind. We teach biblical health principles that can eradicate obesity and disease. We have everything you need to feel better than you've ever felt in your life. Act now to get your biblical health ebook and DVD both for free. TheMinisterOfWellness.com, TheMinisterOfWellness.com. All right, what's going on, ladies and gentlemen? We have a great friend of the show. Now, last time she came on was in February 2020. Um, a lot of you maybe haven't seen that interview, but um, it was great to have her here. Now, her channel is called African Esquire. Um, but our sister Tyranny is here today to uh, give us a lot of updates and you know, definitely speak on some things that she has, you know, going on. And, you know, we've seen, you know, the new developments with Ghana and Kenya and all these different things we want to talk to her about today. So, Sister Tyranny, thank you for joining us on the show today. Thank you so much for having me again, Brother Phil. I hope you are doing well and keeping safe with all this craziness going on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We definitely got to keep it safe. So, you know, there's a lot of newcomers have came, you know, since the last time you were here. So let people know, you know, who you are for those that don't know you. And maybe some people already know, but let people know. Sure. So essentially, um, my name is Tierney Cherie. I have a YouTube channel, African Esquire TV, which will soon be transitioning to being called We Charge Colonialism. That's my organization that I founded with a number of people. But to tell you a little bit about myself, essentially, I am an attorney. But the most important thing, I think, as far as what we're talking about today is I'm an organizer. I work with a lot of different African-led organizations. And the purpose that I organize for is pan african unity and not just unity for the sake of being united but unity for the sake of addressing our problems our problems are from the colonial system that never ended it's still in existence and imperialism is what it falls under so our goal really is to push forward a narrative that african people we have to shift our focus from just talking about racism or discrimination or just talking about corruption or things that are sub issues and really focus on our real issue. So what I'm here to talk about today is a movement um, I've work, been working on WCC. We've been working on with a number of other Pan-African organizations. So I'm excited to get into that. All right. So just for, for more background, this in itself, we're talking about you. Were you, you know, born and raised here in America? Yes. Okay, born and raised here. Your you, you lineage is here, right? Okay, <laughs> just wanted to establish that. Yeah, because because I'm a descendant I'm of the transatlantic slave trade of in uh -huh. America. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so you 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 a sister of the soil. Got gotcha. you. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> so so with that being said, what made you go from maybe identifying, you know, more so just with people here to thinking, you know, maybe we need to think more Pan African. You know, what made you really go that ideal? I think it came from reading a lot of Garvey, um, probably first from reading Malcolm, actually, and then reading Garvey and then kind of drawing these parallels. Marcus Garvey made an analysis that is true today, is that when he went to every single place around the world, whether he was in Jamaica, whether he came to the United States, whether he went to Europe, wherever he went, African people were always the bottom, at the bottom. We were always the most oppressed. We were always the poorest. We were always the most disenfranchised. So if that's always the case for us, wherever we go, the question has to be, what is it that we're all facing collectively? We can't be facing something different if we're all facing the same thing. And Marcus Garvey came to the conclusion that because of this, we have to come together. If we're dealing with the same system, what sense does it make to fight it individually where the system actually works collectively? If you know that Pan African, what Pan Africanism is a response to, it's essentially a response to Pan Europeanism. The United States doesn't just oppress African people by itself. 
the United Kingdom doesn't just oppress African people by itself. France doesn't just oppress African people by itself. These powers work collectively. Anytime that you are able to understand what happened at the Berlin Conference, it was a number of Africa, a number of European powers coming together and deciding on a united agenda to oppress Africans. Same thing happened prior to the Berlin Conference during the transatlantic slave trade. It wasn't just one power working alone. It was Portugal collaborating with England, collaborating with France, collaborating with the US. So if we understand that the people who are oppressing us unite whenever they're coming to, to handle and deal with us, then we can't handle or deal with them alone. We have to come together for that. So that's really what made me uh, realize that we're all facing a united struggle. And then of course, there's the simple just definitions. Of course, we have the definition of race. Race, we know, is a is a concept that really came from the Europeans, black, white, Asian. Our race, we would say, is black. But our nationality, we know nationality means where were you born? I was born in the United States of America. That's my nationality. But my ethnicity, what eth ethnic group do I belong to? I can't say black is my ethnicity. Again, race, black, that's a color. Um, I can't say American is my ethnicity. American is a nationality. My ethnicity, the blood that flows through my brain, through, through my veins is African. And so that was a simple, easy conclusion to draw just from looking at the circumstances around me. You know, that I agree with, you know, 100%, everything that you just said, and you, you said it so eloquently. Uh, but unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, they, there are people, you know, and, and I get the argument on both sides because I've seen the argument. I've even seen the dissension on both sides where some people that could think that, you know, Pan-Africanism doesn't work. Some people will say that Pan-Africanism don't work. They don't want Pan-Africanism on a continent. Look, they all separated. They don't want to unify, you know, you may have people like Julius Malema, who, who's really strong in Pan-Africanism, right? You may have someone like PLO Lumumba, you know, he's strong in that. Um, but outside, maybe those two brothers that's really well known on the continent that, you know, speak in this manner and push hard for the, for the people to unify. What would you say to the people that say, well, you know, we tried to do Pan-Africanism, but, but Africans don't want to join with us. What would you say to that? I'd say a number of things. One, I would say those people probably need to learn their history more. If you know your history, you understand that Pan-Africanism was a threat. It did work. You had different countries in Africa coming together with Africans throughout the world. It was Africans in the U.S., united with Africans in the Caribbean, united with Africans in the continent. And at that time, you have people like Kwame Nkrumah, you have people like Sekou Toure, you have Haley Selassie. Over in the U.S., you have Malcolm, who was going Going over there. Dr. King has gone over there. W.E.B. Du Bois died in Ghana um, working under uh, Kwame Nkrumah. So there's a long legacy to go through. And then if you bring it up to the 80s, even you had Thomas Sankara, who was friends, close friends with Samora Michelle. You have Maurice Bishop, who was also, um, who was also comrades with Sankara. There's a long history of Pan-Africanism. I think our people don't know the history. And it's one thing to say something doesn't work versus I don't know of it working. And that's what I think we should be more comfortable saying instead of making definitive statements as if we have a lock on history throughout the entire uh, the entire African civilization. If you don't know, you should be comfortable enough to say, I don't know. And that way, someone who does know can point you to the sources. But as far as it doesn't work it, in, a common, in, a, in a current sense, um, the other thing I would say is that many people are not aware of those who are, are struggling on the continent. There are many Pan-Africanists on the continent. It's not just, you know, Julius Malema. It's also people like Kemi Seba. There's so many voices who are coming together and saying that we have to unite. But the reason we should understand why Pan-Africanism has been thwarted in the past is because there have been direct op co covert operations to the stabilized Pan-Africanist movement. So this happened, obviously, with every single African president that was radical. You see coups happening all the time. You see assassination attempts. We can go down the long list of Africans who were assassinated, people who were taken out. They weren't taken out for by other Africans. They were taken out by the CIA, who would hire other Africans to be the scapegoat. They were taken out by the counterintelligence agencies inside of France, all of these imperialist powers. They were 
are the ones behind the scenes. So how can you say Pan-Africanism doesn't work? If it doesn't work, you wouldn't have these powers coming behind the scenes to try to manipulate African politics all the time. And uh, the, the last thing I will say on that whole idea is that all because something has not uh, has not succeeded as of yet does not necessarily mean that you stop doing it. I hear people, the same people who say Pan-Africanism doesn't work. Do you not know that there were t attempts at reparations in the past? Many of those same people, they say we need to fight for reparations. Did, did you? Are you not aware that at one time the Africans were promised reparations, 40 acres and a mule, and that same promise was reneged on? Or should Africans stop calling for reparations because it didn't work in the past? Are you not aware that there was a continual struggle for reparations? It didn't just start five years ago. It has been going on and on. You might be hearing it on the internet more, but there's always been organizations struggling for that. It hasn't worked yet. And frankly, I don't see it working right now. Are we saying that we shouldn't fight for things because it hasn't worked? That's just not intelligent. What you fight for, you fight for your sovereignty. It doesn't matter uh, what the imp oppressor has done to try to suppress your efforts. You still fight because you are a people who has enough dignity to believe in yourself, enough dignity, dignity to believe that right will overcome. So I don't really take those arguments serious. Um, I think people just have to do more research and also be very very clear on what their politics are, because as far as I see it, I don't know of any Africans who, whose movement has worked as of yet. If we're looking for Africans to be equal with white society, nothing has worked. So the idea that Pan-Africanism didn't work as of yet, it's kind of an unfair measurement whenever I hear people make that analysis. Well, you mentioned the history. I've I, I done a uh, live stream uh, a while back about Memorandum 46. Do you know about that? No. Okay. During the Jimmy Carter presidency, they came out with Memorandum 46. And this goes back to the history of what you was talking about. And in that live stream, if you read Memorandum 46, it details to say we need to keep those black power movement people away from the African continent, lest they connect with them and destabilize our efforts you know, on the continent. Right. So what you said is true. The U.S. government has always tried to keep you know, us, especially black Americans, right? Africans, black Americans separated, mm -hmm. you know, even, you know, if you notice, and that's, that's bringing it all the way up to today, right? Prior to this pandemic, black folks was going to the continent a lot. You know, Ghana had the year return mm -hmm. and I knew something was up when I saw the New York times, the New York post, LA times, all these big white media corporations, covering the year of return yeah and i say well why do they care about the year of return mm -hmm. what's what is so important for them to cover the year of return they never talk about anything in ghana right. Nothing, right right then i start seeing all these stories about black americans moving to ghana and black and it, like it just they kept recovering it yes like oh my god they, they moving to ghana like that and then it's like when this you know virus pops off Oh, we got to shut down all this travel. Oh, no, no travel. Nobody going nowhere. And, and like, in my opinion, you were trying to lock us in. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like the Bible where, where Pharaoh didn't want to let God's people go. Mm -hmm. saying, let, let, let me hold on to them. And then also what I thought was strange and interesting. In that time period, then you have a rise of, you know, well, I'm, a, I'm, an, I, I'm an American. I, I mean, listen, we both Americans, okay? Our ancestors built this place. We know. You, the 40 acres of meal reparation belong to both of us, right? And I want that. But it started having, you know, this anti-Pan-Africanism, you know, sentiment rose up pretty heavy mm -hmm. and pretty strong, right? And I'm like, like what you said earlier, we haven't even really done a true Pan-Africanism, not even five years. Yeah without any disruption like have you have you ever like anybody here connected with a brother in senegal or a sister in south africa or another brother in ethiopia and, and work and see what we can do together we haven't done it yeah and unfortunately because this is the generation of i have not seen this therefore it does, has not happened a lot of our people are willing to go with that narrative and i think what you said was very true pointing out the fact that mainstream media mainstream newspapers 
have jumped on this, I noticed the same thing. It's very sensationalized to them. What they're not stating, though, is the threat to the white society. The threat to them is this idea that Africans in America will not identify themselves as slaves. Because if you think about what you're saying, if you're saying you're not African, if I'm saying I'm not African, essentially I'm just American, well, my history began in slavery then. My history didn't begin as a white person. My people, whenever they were here, they were only slaves until they became second-class citizens, which is what I look at us today, if you look at what we're struggling with. So the threat is that these people who have been slaves to this system start identifying themselves as being a free people, being a people who are deserving of sovereignty. Sovereignty is very much a threat to this system. The idea that we should control our own politics, that we are distinct people, that we're not a part of this national legacy. So I think that's what it is. They want to keep us feeling like we're connected to this system, even when the system is going adverse to our own interests. We see that constantly happening with our people. Yes, yes. I I, I, th- I heard. Now, listen, I'll tell people this. In, in our company, we practice in our company pan-Africanism, okay? In our company. How do we do that? I have, you know, someone that's Ethiopian that, that works here with us. I have another brother that's Kenyan, that, that's one of, you know, our editors, right? I have, you know, many contributors throughout the world in other places who, who are uh, black or African or whatever you want to call the person for that day. We all working together, right? Yeah. So if I can do it, then why can't we do it on a bigger scale? And, they, you know, my, the other brothers and sisters throughout the world, they teach me things that I didn't know. And then I teach them things, especially about white supremacy, yes. and especially like right now you're looking at Ethiopia. Right. And what's happening there, how the Jim Crow Joe administration had put sanctions and trying to destabilize Ethiopia. Yes. And, and Eritrea, they put sanctions on them. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. And you see them, you know, and shout out to my Ethiopian brothers and sisters out there fighting against, you know, the devil. Now, the one thing that now I want to bring that up with you. I was discussing this with a uh, sister Juan Gale the other day. And I said that the one thing I think with the uh, Ethiopians are doing, which is great. They're fighting the rich which is great. They're fighting back against white supremacy and they're noticing it. The only thing I think they're making a mistake on. And I said this just behind the scenes, but now I'm going to say it publicly is that you have not joined with the diaspora as to fight against white supremacy, even with your situation, mm-hmm. you know? So why do you think in your opinion, they haven't even moved that route yet? Not to say they ain't thought about it, but when they're alone, it's easier for white supremacy to get them. But let's say like with the George Floyd thing, right? Everybody joined with George Floyd. Mm-hmm. So it made it a much bigger thing. I think I'm actually observing more of that, actually, Brother Phil, because I've, I've observed, for example, Ethiopians doing organiz- doing programs with organizations that are based in that diaspora, one that I know of, Black Alliance for Peace, for example. And um, I've also observed the diaspora kind of being the voice the, the voice of, of Ethiopia and Eritrea. Um, with their domestic policy. So if anyone is not aware, there was a recent Virginia governor election and the election went to the Republicans. Now we don't think that Republicans are any better than Democrats, obviously, but basically the Ethiopians in Virginia sent a message because of how upset they were (laughs) with the treatment of Ethiopia by Joe Biden, they really turned up and switched parties. So I, I do see some, but I can understand what you're saying. We we also see kind of a mainstream struggle, especially with certain uh, white liberal groups, and we never trust them, obviously. But I don't know. I've seen a, I've seen a mixture. I don't know if I've seen um, heavily, you know, one way or the other. To be honest, another thing that I'm seeing, even with the Ethiopian protest and, and everything, I'm seeing the same cast of characters like. This is happening in Ethiopia, but all of a sudden these, you know, white folks show up. Oh, this is so bad. This is so wrong. And I'm like, I put my head down like this as I'm seeing that. And I'm not saying some of them mean uh, bad. Some of them may mean well, but they do the same thing to us. They like to jump in the protest of what we're doing. And then what they do, they create these nonprofits and then they finesse a bag. Right. 
Absolutely. Like Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation. That's white owned and white controlled. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's definitely something that we, one of those things like you were saying, like we have to trade information. It's not just you schooling us. It's like us trading information. Mm -hmm. But now I think that us who are in America are very aware of how these white liberals do us, how we'll be a hashtag for them and they'll create an organization and a foundation supposedly devoted to our cause where they're making a lot of money off of it and they get to live their nice peaceful lives and they get to be the saviors of white of of, of black people they we we have that experience with them um i, I will i think i think part of the issue that's happening though is that when you're a country that's surrounded and i would say ethiopian eritrea are surrounded if you consider the fact that even their neighboring african countries that could you might you might say be allies so for example we've seen uh prime minister uh the prime minister of ethiopia meeting with uhuru kenyatta uh we've seen mr abi president as president of ethiopia abi ahmad we've seen him also meeting with paul kagame what well, a problem with those two people i just listed they're very controlled by the west they are very much tight with the west every time that you see some type of conference happening where you have all the major players talking about okay how are we going to basically overtake africa many times those are the people who will be there so you're kind of surrounded even the people who would be your allies around you they're controlled by your enemies and so i think that there does kind of become this need for support that might blind you to who you're getting support from in certain situations because i certainly think that um if you're a country that's kind of a sitting duck in a water full of sharks you probably take any help that's offered at the time right well i know recently seen um president kenyatta go to ethiopia and i think he was actually you know standing with him like yeah i agree with y'all y'all need to fight for your you know your, your freedom and and, and so I don't know how, I mean, yes, I know they do deal with the West because President Kenyatta came over here, uh, sat down with Jim Crow Joe, and then all of a sudden when he gets back, he's talking about mandates. Yes. Some of the Kenyans we wasn't even dealing with. Yeah. I think I think President Kenyatta does a good job of playing both sides because mm -hmm. if, if if any country is the one that is the launch point for Africom for the, for your viewers who don't know Africom is essentially the U.S. military command inside of Africa. They're inside of a number of nations throughout the African continent. Kenya is basically the number one Africom partner. So anytime that you want to see demonstrations happening, you see Joe Biden give a call, um, U.S. military operations happening, you'll see Joe Biden give a call to Uhuru Kenyatta. And actually, whenever the there was first um, information going out that there was some type of inst instability inside of Ethiopia, that's what the West was saying, right? They were saying that, oh, you know, something's happening. They're committing genocide over there against the people, uh, the TPLF, the, the Tigray people. There was actually a call that came out, you know, it was Joe Biden calling Kenyatta about these Ethiopians. This is before the sanctions too. So um, he's very closely linked to the U.S. I would say probably him and Kagame are the, one of the tightest um, with the U.S. foreign policy. And so he plays both sides. I've seen he went to Ethiopia, gave good lip service. But obviously, at this point in our struggle, we understand it's not what you say, it's what you do. And if you're keeping, if you're getting money from those people who are sending these people into our territory, and if you're taking orders from those people, what good is you standing here for me? And we've seen this many times in the past, too. We've seen African leaders who've been bought and sold from the West um, make appearances inside of countries that are trying to fight off imperialism, and they make good lip service but we also don't know what what's been being said behind do closed doors because there's been many times behind closed doors those same people that look to be standing with us were actually being used for proxy wars or for um, conspiring for coup d'etats and things like that yeah and, and you know the, the sad thing is and, and like i said even on our platform we start saying the west a lot more well we definitely say white supremacy but in relation to africa we, we definitely like to say the west because yeah. We have to train, you know, like that Martin Luther King says something so, you know, eloquently to say you got to get the language right mm -hmm. and, and, and calling it the West is to let you know it, it is the global white supremacist system that's trying to destabilize these African nations, you know, just like recently Ghana, right? Yeah. Ghana, Ghana came up with, you know, they I, I, I did the research, Ghana only had like a little over 1,200 people, you know, pass away of the virus. And now they, they come up with, oh, well... <laughs> You got to, you can't come here unless, unless you got the jab and like people are like what and, and, and they don't have enough jabs for Ghanaian people if they want it right 
Yeah. And then I end up finding out once again what you were talking about, Ghana and Kenya, those presidents, uh, Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados pay U.S. lobbyists mm. to get in line to get these 80 million uh, vaccines. Mm hmm. You know that the U.S. Is supposed to give out. It makes, and I thought about it. I said, well, maybe they probably told them, if we give it to you, you got to put in mandates. Because it was interesting how both of those countries all of a sudden started talking about mandates out of the blue. It was random. Talked about it before. Yeah, it was random. I mean, I, I'm in a chat with a number of Ghanaians, and they're thrown off. Like, why all of a suddenly? Like, and you know, it's it goes to show just how close closely we are puppets to this regime because I like that you said we have to use this the right cor correct verbiage and this is a real big part of why the um the coll collective that we're going to talk about African unity movement for decolonization we're trying to shift the narrative from just talking about oh racism police brutality let's talk about colonialism and imperialism which is being controlled by the west this is important because Nana Kufu Ado, are you are we really supposed to believe that all of a sudden, despite the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic has for the most part spared Africa, that all of a sudden he decided on his own to um, go and have these mandates and give preferential treatment, obviously, to the American vaccination companies. Now, keep in mind the fact that there's actually a vaccine in Cuba right now. This vaccine has been shown to have a higher rate of, um, of protection against COVID. Um, and I also think it's more of a traditional vaccine. The ones in America are mRNA. This is a this is a vaccine a lot of people are even saying could surpass the other American vaccinations. But the ones who are holding that up is the World Health Organization. But no one's standing for the fact that why are we only getting vaccines from people who are basically our enemies? I mean, if you if you understand what, how imperialism works, these people are the ones controlling your resources. Why can't we have uh, vaccines from indigenous peoples who have also been oppressed? So that kind of shows that people are making deals with the government behind closed doors. That's really the future of neocolonialism. You constantly are having leaders who are supposed to be representing you, actually representing your bosses behind the scenes. And so I'm very confident that Nana Kufo Ado and whoever else is um, starting these, um, these, these mandates that are just saying, oh, you have to go through these vaccine companies that have nothing to do with, um, with our people, with Africa, or nothing to do with the people who have been colonized. You know, I'm very sure that they're having meetings behind closed doors that no one can see and that basically they have a puppet master pulling their strings. Yeah, and, and and with with that, if you if you remember, um, you remember the president of Madagascar? He had yeah. that uh, COVID organics drink that he said that was helping people. Yeah. And when President Magafuli was you know living, um, he said, "Man, I'm going over there with, with with my people over here and get this COVID organics. I, I want that." And you know, yeah. you remember you remember the video of him getting the shipments in, and they were drinking it, and everything was cool. And then MAGA Foley has shown that the, the PCR test, at least the ones they gave them, was faulty and giving all positives on, on freaking fruit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? He said, nah, I'm good with that. I want nothing from y'all. And then all of a sudden, this brother getting messed off. Right, right. You and the, and the, the thing that was very disturbing to me in that whole situation was just the idea that Africans can't solve their own problems that's literally like what we've seen other africans basically putting out there in the news because instead of studying and like saying okay what is it that you're talking about there was just this basically blowing people off like well well we, we can't trust you know whatever you say about uh what's good for your health right and then then i don't know if you remember that um they tried to assassinate the president of madagascar do you remember that I think I kind of remember that, but not too much. Yeah. Yeah, it was a foiled attempt from a French. Remember, you mentioned the French. Yeah. Okay, I remember. A that, French yeah. military guy tried to assassinate the president of Madagascar, and um, you know, I ever since then he'd been pretty quiet. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't get him, but he he was, he was been pretty quiet. And I remember Malema was saying that, hey, we need to develop our own uh, vaccines. Yeah. He's saying give them to our people. We say, well, why we want they stuff for? Yeah, you know, and um, I think even the president of Ghana, you know, mentioning him, he was saying the same thing too. So I don't know what's going to happen with that. Uh, recently, Ghana had got a million vaccines from uh, the UK, and all of them was about to be expired. Mm. And you know, the problem is that 
the way that this is happening, so for example, with the vaccines, uh, I think it was Moderna and Pfizer, the World Health Organization and the World Trade Organization, they were trying to push for them to basically release the vaccine patents and say, well, if your vaccines are good, let other African countries be able to have the formula so that they can make it themselves. But they fought tooth, tooth and nail to ensure that, no, you're going to basically buy from us. So that shows that this is not really about ending a pandemic for them. It's about the bottom dollar. That's all that they're motivated by. They're motivated by making as much money as possible. So uh, to me, I think Megafully and also the president of Madagascar, what it represented to the West is this idea that no, we don't want to take the medicine that you're going to give us. We, we don't want to uh, be a part of the enrichment of these companies. No, we want to find some ways to solve our own problems. That's always going to be seen as a, as a, as a threat when it comes to the colonial powers, because they never want there to be a thought that we can think independently for ourselves and do good for ourselves. We want us to always feel like we're dependent on them to make vaccines, to ship vaccines, that we need it from American or UK companies. How dare you think that you can do this on your own? So, you know, it's important. I think the president of South Africa has used the word uh, vaccine colonialism. That's what we're seeing. It's, it's vaccine colonialism. You have these people who are giving preference treatment to certain powers and if you try to find other ways to basically treat yourself even if you try to create another vaccine you see those same powers exercising um complete control to ensure that you adhere to what they say is is good which is really basically what's going to give them money yeah yeah the term he used there was a uh, actually vaccine apartheid right that, that's what apartheid, that's the term yeah, he used. Yeah. um but you know from what i'm seeing this younger generation on the African continent, um, they're not going for it. And mm -hmm. that's what I love about the young people on the continent. Because, see, they're connected now. They're on the Internet. Oh, so yeah. you can't, like, for instance, you talked about Ethiopia earlier. No, in the past, they could use, you know, CNN and all the other ones to lie and say, oh, look what this one doing to their people. And then they just live stream now and say, nobody, nothing happening. Look, like, yeah. we all eating food. We relaxing. We about to go to the movies. Nobody can hurt nobody. And that's what's hurting them right now is that definitely. they cannot lie like they used to. Definitely. I mean, I even took the took the bait whenever they first reported that the TPLF was uh, converging onto Addis Ababa. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. like tweeting like, oh, no, y'all, we have to pray for Ethiopia, not realizing that it was completely overblown, that the, they're just trying to give this narrative that the TPLF has mass support and that they're the strong forces out of the country and so yeah definitely it's very valuable getting the opportunity to hear from people who can actually tell us the truth and not relying on our on our, on our oppressors to give us what's really happening inside of africa yeah that's why i told uh sister Juan gail i said listen it's your job to cover this ethiopian story on this platform mm -hmm. i said because i need you on it i say because i say you you are ethiopian it's your responsibility to report this truth and she was reporting a lot of times that you had, they call it white mercenaries mm. in the middle of the TPLF. Now I've been to Tigray, okay? Mm -hmm. Beautiful people. They are so friendly. Mm -hmm. They welcomed us in with open arms. I mean, it was just beautiful, right? Yeah. And, and so the people in Tigray and the political you know, side, TPLF, which TPLF used to run Ethiopia what, for almost 30 years mm -hmm. before they had the you know new democratic elected government was back in 20, what is it, 18? Or so I don't recall. Yeah. So so all this, like I said, they they want to destabilize Ethiopia, and I really believe to to get a foothold so they can have you know because you know they got in Djibouti they have that that you know Af Af Africom they in Djibouti yeah they are well they want to be in Ethiopia as well because there's a lot of resources there for them to get yeah yeah I think um when the TPLF, it's kind of this thing where you have different fractional parties who become dis disgruntled with basically the politics of their government. But rather than struggle for politics internally, the unfortunate thing that they did is they appealed to the West for help. And um, I don't know if you saw Brother Phil, but there was just a, a news conference where the head of the TPLF admitted that the Americans advised them to basically converge on Addis Ababa. So it's what we, I think we already do. One, because you're not, America doesn't sanction everyone. 
if you if they sanction you, that means that there's a specific reason they're doing it. There's a lot of people who are committing quote unquote human rights violations that the American government ignores, but they sanction Ethiopia and Eritrea. Um, that's number one. Uh, number two, just the 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 um, the military equipment. Like it's like, where are you getting this? Are you this narrative that's being paid. Uh, painted that this is just a, a a poor political faction, and you know they they don't receive any support. No, this is not normal for a small group to basically get this type of elevation. And we've seen this before. I mean, this happens all the time inside of African politics. You have again one small group that the United States look at looks at it as an opportunity. They said, "We'll we'll help you can take control. We'll help you to have power in the region if you just you know do what we tell you." And that's unfortunately for a lot of African people the downfall of a lot of us we take the bait instead of trying to figure out our problems among ourselves you know african african solutions for african problems not western solutions why would you want to appeal to someone outside of your territory to deal with internal conflicts and so yeah we're definitely seeing that they basically have took the bait and went with the western imperialists unfortunately but you know when all this got started and i see that the, the beautiful thing about you know you know, which our platform have moved to covering, you know, more, you know, definitely African news is that but prior to all these quote unquote problems, you know, the mistake Ethiopia made in the West eyes. What's that? The dam? Yep. Yep. <laughs> go back to the Willie Lynch letter. Yeah. The one key in the Willie Lynch letter says this, we cannot allow them to not depend on us. They always must depend on us, love us and revere us lest yeah. we lose control. Yeah, that's, that's the will. This letter is literally the white supremacy Bible. Oh, yeah, literally. Yes, absolutely. So how dare those Ethiopians by to put this dam online and have power to 80 percent of the country like this? Right. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah. Especially with Egypt being basically, again, America's lapdog. And mm -hmm. essentially that would make them lose out on that strategic position, having control over the dam. So, yeah. Yeah, it's it's like I tell people, global, <laughs> the West, or white supremacy is a problem for everybody. So this is why Pan-Africanism can work, because we're collectively dealing with white supremacy. Yes. Absolutely. So with that, that, tell us about, about the organization and the conference, because like I said, we talk about all these different issues. And, you know, there are people out there that do believe in Pan-Africanism. They, they, plenty of them do. Right. And I'm a firm believer of join with the tribe that think like you. We can't focus on people that don't want it. We can't even, you know, we'll just waste our life doing that. Right. Right. So let's talk about, you know, the organization and what y'all putting together. Yeah. And I'm glad you said that the last point that you made, because I do see a lot of our brothers and sisters that will fight with different movements, whether it's the ADOS movement or foundational black American, they'll fight with those movements all day. But at the end of the day, people are going to believe what they want to believe. If they don't want to be African, if they don't want to identify as African, I don't feel like I can personally make them change their mind by debating with them. But what I can do is practice Pan-Africanism. To me, if you want to say that Pan-African works show that it works you say you see brother phil doing the same thing he's giving voice to african people who's connecting with africans throughout the as, through african experience so that we can come together more powerful that's practicing pan-africanism so essentially the project that we're doing is just that um to anyone that says that africans do not see themselves as african i've seen i've heard that before like they only see themselves as nigerian or south african to me, anyone that says that africans do not look at us as being African or do not look at us as kin to anyone that says that we cannot come together because of tribalism. I think this project comes in direct contradiction to those sentiments. Essentially, we're Africa Unity Movement for Decolonization. It's a collaborative effort between a number of Pan-Africanist organizations. I'll name a few, uh, but there's um, probably about 15, I believe. But uh, we have AAPRP, the All African People's Revolutionary Party. We have the Pan-African Congress of Azania. We have Pan Africanist Congress of Azania. We have the We Charge Colonialism, which is um, my organization. We have Movement for African Emancipation in Nigeria. We have um, Economic Fighters League in Ghana. And we have organization CASA in Haiti. I'm trying to um, you know, show you more of the representation that it's not just one part of the African experience, but we try to be as expanding as possible. But essentially, we are coming together for the specific purpose of dealing with language. Our issue 
issue right now as African people is that we focus on domestic issues as if it's completely separate from what's going on in our neighboring African countries. So for example, I might be inside of Ivory Coast and I'm so focused on what's going on with these inter-ethnic conflicts that I'm not relating that fact that those conflicts are being sponsored by the same oppressor that's also oppressing my brothers and sisters right over here and oppressing my brothers and sisters over there in the Americas. That's the white supremacist global globalist system that we're dealing with. So essentially what we're going to be doing on Friday the 17th which is the 70th anniversary of We Charge Genocide. I'm sure many of you know about that, but in case you don't, that's when a number of Africans in the United States, including Paul Roberson and William Padmore, um, Patterson, sorry, they went to the United Nations and charged the United States of of, of America with the crime of genocide against African people. We have a number of Pan-Africanist organizations. Our purpose is to charge this entire globalist system with colonialism, understanding that that's what we're dealing with. If you're African in America, internal colonialism, we're dealing with internal colonialism. We're just the same as um, you might see inside of an African country. You see the people being depleted by the colonists. We're being depleted by the white class system in America. Whether you're in South Africa, that's settler colonialism. Whether you're inside of any place where we are dealing with neo-colonialism, it's all colonialism. And we're, we're not just charging these, these countries and corporations, and we list them out very specifically with these crimes, but we're also stating demands. This is what we believe real decolonization will look like, because we know that there was a movement for decolonization, you know, following the 60s, where you had all these African countries that were declaring um, independence. But we should study that movement very closely, because Kwame Nkrumah very much diagnosed the fact that the fact that you're getting independence doesn't mean that you're really going to be independent. If your oppressor is co controlling your resources, if your oppressor is controlling your politics, if your oppressor is controlling everything inside of your country, you can't say you're decolonized. You're still colonized, but you're a neo-colonial country now. And as uh, Kwame Nkrumah said, neo-colonialism is more dangerous than formal colonialism. At least in formal colonialism, I have no confusion about who it is oppressing me. If I'm a colony of Britain, I know that my oppressor is Queen Elizabeth and her sons. That's what I'm sure about. But if I'm technically free, yet all of the corporations inside of my country are owned by, by England, well, it's harder to say who your oppressor is because you don't see you know, Queen Elizabeth over there. You don't see the Prince Charles and Prince Henry or something. I don't know their names. <laughs> don't, you don't see the British family over there. Harry and William. Yeah, all of them. <laughs> William, Harry, you don't see them. You see these people who are coming in with their businesses and hey, they might even hire Africans. So you can't, you know, say that they're against you. They're hiring your 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 mother and your father. So that's not as bad. That's why neocolonialism is dangerous because it's very hidden. And because of that, a lot of our people don't organize around it. So essentially what we're doing, releasing a declaration, we're going to name a number of countries who are guilty of colonialism, name corporations and institutions. And then the purpose is that next year, in July, July 21st through the 23rd, we're going to come together and formally um, make this declaration basically our call to action. And we're going to have a convention. Unfortunately, because of the new COVID um, restrictions with travel, we will not be able to do it completely in person. We wanted to do it in Zimbabwe, a country which is under sanctions right now. Um, but we're probably going to have to do a hybrid where we're going to have the people in Zimbabwe organize the convention, but us chime in uh, via um, satellite and basically have a full demonstration where we're going to break down the colonial system. So all of that will be released on um, the registration for the convention will be released on just December 17th, the same day that, that our declaration is being released and posted to our social media. So I can give you that contact whenever you're ready. Oh, yeah. So, OK. And now we don't know if travel restrictions may change, you know, because they say this new variant is mild. So yeah. there's really no justification to be blocking travel from South Africa to Zimbabwe and other African countries. Right. So if if they, you know, unblock that travel, you know, will you still have it in Zimbabwe? 
So because of the issue of travel with, you know, you have to get your plane ticket and everything, we felt like it's just best to do it as a hybrid. But because we're still trying to have the people in Zimbabwe actually, you know, ha still have it presently um, there, that way people can have an option. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. And that's kind of the difficult part about this is that we don't know, like, if they could easily change these restrictions in two weeks. So that way you'll have an option if you do wish to go to Zimbabwe for there and be there in person. And that was the ultimate ultimate uh, purpose of it that we be there in person um, or because we don't know the circumstances what's going to happen if you want to just register for the online component that will be available all right so 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 sister tell people how they can get to you know all of that to register um, you know YouTube channel your know, Instagram let people know how they can you know get in contact with you Okay, so I would uh, follow us on Twitter. This is for Africa Unity Movement for Decolonization. It's at sign um, A Decolonization on Twitter. And also you can follow us on Facebook at AUMD 1884. You can email us AUMD 1884 at gmail.com. And via these ways, essentially, you'll get um, the notification when the report, the declaration is released. I'll warn you now, it's pretty long, but we wanted to do a thorough examination of this because we wanted to arm African people with knowledge so that you can have something written where you can say, hey, you know, these are my rights and this is what's being done against our people. So that's why it's very long, but it will be released on the 17th. And um, also, if you want to follow me on our YouTube channel, again, it's African Esquire TV. We'll be changing the name soon to Recharge Colonialism, but as of today, it's still African Esquire TV. You can find me on YouTube. All right. Am I there? Yeah, you're there. <laughs> All right. No, I, I forgot I had hit the mute button. Um, <laughs> So we definitely want to thank our sister for coming by today on the show. It, it was great, you know, and, and like I said, there's a lot of people I need to reach out to and circle back. That just people we need to bring back on the show and to talk about, you know, this is going on today. Because sister, it's so much has happened since the last time you were here to now. It's like it is so crazy. It is. It is. And unfortunately, you know, this pandemic has some of us losing our minds. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we'll make sure to put, you know, the contacts, like say, in the, you know, pinned comment. And we also put her channel uh, it, the way we in the title, that way you can just click it, you know, and just go in and subscribe. So, you know, Sister Tierney, thank you for joining us on the show today. We greatly appreciate you coming by once again and uh, gracing us with, with all the information. Thank you so much for having us. And um, I'm very much proud of this platform, the growth it's had and the impact that it has on just spreading the message of Pan-Africanism. If anyone also wants to try to say Pan-Africanism doesn't work, just go to Africa Diaspora News Channel because clearly you're not actually looking out there to see what's there as far as information. So I definitely appreciate your platform. During this holiday season, give your loved ones a gift that keeps on giving for the rest of their life. Torpedo Pot is the only affordable self-growing flower pot that ensures your future food survival. All you do is add soil, seeds, and seedlings to the flower pot and watch your plants grow. Torpedo Pot can grow nutritious food in such abundance and variety that you can produce more food than your local farm. Visit www.torpedopot.com